So talk about the extra how extraction happens. Um, well, I did it in ArcGIS. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! Uh, I did it in ArcGIS, um, but the the process itself, the idea is is very. Uh, I mean, can be translated to other GIS software, um, and what it does is, it goes from having a, a continuous cover of the country to um, clipping or cutting only those chunks of land that represent protected area. So, in ArcGIS, the the uh, the processing tool that I used is Extract by Mask. Uh, I'm not sure in uh, Quantum GIS what's the name of, of the tool. Extract Clipper, okay. Extraction Clipper. And we are gonna have a little bit of time with Quantum GIS, hopefully end of today, if not uh, possibly tomorrow. So how interoperable is QGIS with ARN? Um, reasonably, which is to say the shape files go back and forth, no problem. The raster files, the ARC format is a, is a proprietary format, extremely cumbersome because it puts pieces of a raster file in two different directories. Um, you can, in ARC, work with GeoTIFFs. And that's what that's what QGIS uses exclusively. But there are little tricks, and so for example, this coverage right here, which is elevation across Ethiopia, um, that coverage, sorry, it'll be on, um, is actually an ARC coverage, an ARC raster grid file, um, and I just pulled it in. Again, there's a little trick where one of the files in one of the directories has all of the spatial data. So just wanted to take you on a little tour of a bit more imagery. So here are the data that Mona just showed you for MODIS. Um, so this is a MODIS-derived change, and she distilled it down just to forest loss. And so that's what you're seeing in these in these red pixels, okay? Those are areas of forest loss between what year and what year? 2002 and 2012. Okay. 10 years. And of course we can do things like add data on water, okay? And we can add data on roads, which can help us orient. We have the elevational data. But complementary to the MODIS data that Mona, Mona just showed us, which is that, we can also look at this product, which is um, from Landsat. So a finer resolution spatially, but a coarser resolution temporally. Um, and just to show you where those data come from, it's this data set. Global Forest Change 2000 to 2014. Um, and again, all of these data sources are free for download. It's still a big job to do the download because the data sets are so big. Um, and then just to show you one other resource that I use quite a bit is this uh, Global Land Cover Facility. It's out of the University of Maryland. And you can see it's providing products from Landsat, MODIS, um, this other platform, AVHRR, which is older, um, the actual imagery from, from a bunch of satellites. So it's a lot of different data products. And when you have a particular analysis in, in, in mind, it's worth going here and seeing if there's something that's particularly relevant. And what Bilal was just mentioning are these vegetation continuous fields um, where they essentially get away from the idea of classification and instead what they're giving us is data on how much of this half kilometer pixel is covered by tree, how much is covered by shrub, how much is co covered by herbaceous vegetation and how much has no cover. Okay, so nice continuous data there. And then one other source to show you, which I'll show you some stuff from in a moment, is this one. 
Um, it's from a, a, it's called the Nighttime Lights data source. It's actually a couple different sensors or a bunch of different sensors. Um, I'll show you in a minute this Nighttime Lights series. It's really interesting because it gives a 21 year series of essentially stable lights at night. So if a light shows up one night and then disappears or shows up intermittently, it's probably fire, okay? But if a light is on every night, it's probably an electrical light. Doesn't necessarily mean people are there because lights can exist like at a parking lot or at some sort of facility, but it's certainly an indicative, an indication of, of development, okay? Um, so those are just a, a bunch of different data sources and for whatever analysis you may need to do, you have to think about what are the crucial parameters to, to consider. Um, okay, so go back here, showed you the data source that Mona had, had shown you, again simplified a bit. Um, we can look at this Landsat coverage for forest gains, you can see just a few speckles around um, around Ethiopia. Mona, can you close the door, please? Um, but if we look at forest loss, unfortunately, that's quite a bit more common. Um, and I'm going to start zooming into this region, okay? And you can see some some real foci. Um, and then, as a complementary thing, we can look at the nighttime lights, which is more of an indication of human presence, okay? And you see the obvious concentrations like Addis, but as we zoom in, you start seeing little villages. But of course, these are the villages that are stable enough that at least they have a generator that's on most nights, okay? If somebody doesn't have any access to electricity, you don't see them on this, okay? And then, of course, we can overlay those same parks data. That's the whole uh, WPDA data. Here are the parks that we're actually going to. Yep. Okay, so this is Senkele for tomorrow. This is uh, Abhijata Shala, and this is Bali. Okay? And looking at the nighttime lights coverage, we really don't see any nighttime lights except for a little bit here and a little bit here in those, in those reserves. So we're not seeing permanent stable developments within those sites. 